Uh, the next presentation is uh, by Mike Thomas, that's me. Um, and I, I will then, at the end of it, introduce our last speaker, Anna. Um, so, it's soon. Oh, I now see what problem everybody's having. There's presentation, thank you. Uh, let, me, let me just get started. Just close it up, yeah, thanks. Not very helpful. Okay, um, I want to talk about means and measures to give consumers greater protection. Um, it's a lovely title, lovely ambitious, aspirational objective. I wish I could give you a silver bullet answer. How do you protect people against price spikes without charging them more for the insurance you're providing? It's very difficult. So let's just go through a few things, try to define a few terms, look at some numbers, uh, try to do some analysis. Um, first off, I'm a consultant, so I'm one of those people who talks about coal in a different way than our previous speakers, so we, we can chat about that. My colleague is uh, Sarah Fairhurst. Many of you know I'm with the Lantau Group. We go back a long way. We've done a lot of work in the Philippines. Um, now, the presentation. Electricity supply sector is a supply chain. There's many, many moving parts. All of the cost of it need to be added up to develop a tariff. If you're not going to subsidize the final tariff, each piece needs to be self-financing, or what I call every tub on its own bottom, or commercially viable, has to be integrated. But most importantly, the decisions have to uh, be appropriate to the risk that's being taken so that you don't wind up incurring too much cost or doing the wrong thing. So. Ultimately, we want this to be a reasonable cost. Uh, maybe, it is, maybe it's possible, maybe it's not, but what do we do? We use regulation or we use markets. We basically use a process to drive costs down. We either ask permission, permission is granted when we provide evidence that our decision is appropriate, or we put it to the market as a competitive test. We do it and we hope that we can make some money. One way or the other, you need something that credentializes or shows the credibility of the decisions. If I ask permission, I should be asked to defend my decision. Why do I want this? Why do I think it's best? The process should interrogate that, should analyze it, and it should justify it. If I'm going to use markets, I take my risk, I get my financing, and I do it. Either works. The world is full of both examples to get reasonable costs, but it does require a certain amount of prerequisites and discipline for everything to work. Now, we ride the fuel prices everywhere. Uh, oh, sorry, before I get this. Actually, you might not know it, but your real tariffs have actually been declining slightly in the last couple of, uh, of years relative to inflation, not so, not so much. And part of that's been because primary energy costs have actually been falling, whether it's oil prices or coal prices. The fun, some of the fundamental underlying costs have been, have been falling. This doesn't talk about price spikes. This just says underneath the price spikes, there's been a, a downward trend, or at least a downward trend we should be seeing. Um, but customers are still nevertheless getting hit by price spikes or, 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 or events. These are um, uh, typical monthly residential tariffs going back to January of 2010 to uh, May 2015. We've collected them, looked at the, the changes, and then sorted them in terms of uh, the reds being above and, and the greens being below. And there have been 13 occasions since 2010 which the change is more than 40 cents per kilowatt hour. So there's quite a bit of, of monthly bill volatility, monthly price volatility that, that probably annoys people, understandably. Why is this happening? How do I know it's going to happen? What can I do about it? How do I avoid it? What's wrong? Now, so we in investigate some of the reasons. Uh, what's, what's been going on? Well, actually, if you sort it out, um, the overall change, to break it out by component, generation, transmission, distribution, and other, which is things like cross-subsidies and fit-all and taxes and things, um, that from February 2010 to May uh, 15, the overall uh, trend accumulating across all of these things has been upward, uh, with the largest component being generation and then some small contributions from the rest. But if you take out 2010 and you just look at each of the other years, um, it's actually been pretty much of a, a balance. Some go up, some go down, but they've netted out pretty much uh, no change. So why is that important? And there's another way of showing it. You can just see 
that if you take out 2010, just the bottom row, January 2011 to May 2015, you know, generation's actually gone down a bit, transmission's gone down a little bit, uh, distribution, supply, and metering have gone up, and other, the taxes and fit components have gone up, and they've netted out to just about zero, minus one. Now, that doesn't mean that there haven't been monthly changes that have been annoying. It just means that they really have been canceling out lately, except for 2010. What was 2010? Well, 2010, we'll get to it, the Nino year. So what, what triggers this? This is just another way of showing sort of the monthlies, and you can see how they're up and they're down and they're, and they're, they're canceling out. They're not always going to cancel out. For example, if fuel prices were steadily rising, um, you know, you would see an upward trend. But over this period of time, fuel prices have been going down, supply and demand has been tightening, uh, you've had some weather events and some things, so they've all kind of balanced out, and it's, it's roughly worked out uh, plus or minus. This might not be expected. When we look at the generation component, what's the largest part of this volatility? It's been the Wesson part. Uh, that is, the, uh, the, 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 the causes of changes in prices from month to month for the smaller customers isn't really directly related to the PSAs or the PPAs or the contracts. Naturally, those are longer-term contracts, so they're not going to fluctuate from month to month. So the exposure to the Wesson has been the largest driver. So if you want less volatility, you've got to be less exposed to the Wesson. That's one, in, one, one lesson. Or you've got to get rid of the Wesson. That's the other lesson. I'm in the you need to manage your exposure to the Wesson camp. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. When in doubt, blame the weather. Always very reliable. Uh, if you don't have anything to talk about, talk about the weather. If you get in an elevator with somebody, always good to talk about the weather. But in here in the Philippines, you can really talk about the weather. Is the weather really matters. Uh, 2010, this is hydro schedule generation profile. On the left-hand side is um, the highest moments of loose on load. And on the right-hand side, the lowest moments of loose on load. And then it's how much hydro that's available to be scheduled. And you can see uh, for different years how much the spread is. 2010, uh, during the period of high load in Luton, there wasn't anywhere near as much water in 2010 as there was in 2009. Huge, huge variation, which then, of course, translated into high seasonal uh, changes in cost as you, the generation mix and the fuel mix all change. So at least part of the underlying volatility, part of it is simply that weather is what it is here. It's driven by the factors that drive it. It is going to always change because you have a hydrothermal system. So that's interesting, and we can talk about that, because we know something about weather cycles. We know a lot more about weather cycles than we know about fuel cost cycles. We can go back and we can say oil prices are going to go up again, we can say oil prices will go down again, but usually when oil prices are really up, we're not really so sure they're ever going to come down again. Well, we can generally be sure that an El Nino will go away and an El La Nino will come, and there will be some cycle. We won't know exactly when, but we know something about that. So some kinds of variability, some kinds of price spikes, some kinds of pricing events occur on, on, on cycles, which we, we actually know something about. And other kinds of volatility are tra traditionally more random, like an outage or a uh, fuel supply disruption or, um, or a supply-demand uh, issue. So this is an important important underlying point. And we compare to the fuel and other factors, the weather variations have really been the strongest part of that. And it's really, this just really highlights how much of this, uh, what I call table setting process, where you set the table to have dinner and they, because you've set the table, you can have the conversation. One reason I believe that people are so sensitized to price spikes, even today, is that we went through several things. We went through 2010's El Nino, and we went through the uh, Malampaya disruption. And these cast long shadows because they have profound effects. And it makes every subsequent price spike a question. Is this, what is it, how did it get there, you know, it is undermined. So we have to understand before we can do anything else. Now the issue with all of this is not the Wesson per se. The Wesson, as I described earlier this morning, needs to be a wild, woolly, and fearsome place. If people are not afraid of the Wesson, they will not enter into contracts. Those contracts will not support new investment. The new investment will not be able to get financed, and it will not get built. You make the Wesson a nice, well-behaved place where nobody really pays any attention to it, and 
you can get cheap prices because they'll be covered by somebody else, you won't enter into a contract. You won't be able to get your plants financed and you'll be exposed to it as soon as something goes wrong. So it's really quite a dynamic thing. On the one side, you want a very volatile spot market because that tells you the nature of the underlying problem that you have. For example, if I run out of water for three months in a year, once every seven years, I want a price spike that comes about that much and somebody's got to be able to figure out how to make money on that. If I, I, I need to, to, to look at my volatility structure to decide my response. Is there an opportunity for demand response? Is there an opportunity for non-hydro generation? Is there an opportunity for non-fossil generation? All of this can be told in the, in the tree rings that are the, are the Wesson. But on the retail side, customers, it is said, do not like price changes. They often don't like price increases, they don't mind price decreases, but even that, uh, the uncertainty of it all is a little bit tricky. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, certainly no one else has any better answer. All of the markets that actually work like markets of the sort that the Philippines has, all have energy price spikes in the wholesale, or wholesale market. So the only way the retail side protects itself from this is are you all awake? Is through contracting. Sorry about that. Um, so let me just, just kind of slow down now and talk about a couple of sort of thoughts. Um, price spikes, whether they're wholesale market price spikes, which I would argue are largely good. And retail monthly bill changes, which are largely misunderstood or not, not desirable or are a byproduct of a number of features in the market, you can't make progress without understanding the problem. We can't actually figure out what to do unless we understand what's causing it. Um, so I think that means getting really understand the hydro sensitivity, the temperature sensitivity, you can't fight the economic fundamentals. If you have a system whose costs are always going to be somewhat more varying, the only solution to that is to pay a premium, take the risk away. In other words, you trade off higher prices for, on average, lower prices that are less predictable. That's, for example, if you want to insure your house against um, a storm, what you are doing is you're paying the insurance company to rebuild your house from time to time to avoid the dramatic cash flow changes that tragedy is often brings. Um, but you're paying for that. You're transforming the, transforming the problem. The first thing to do is understand it. Second, is insurance valued? We talk about people not liking price spikes, but is that really, how much more will people want to pay for it? One of the benefits of, of, say, retail competition is that it's possible that customers will get, at some point, the choice between a flat guaranteed tariff and something that is higher and more, more varying. That's what you would like to see. Uh, this morning I asked sort of what is the, what, what is the prize uh, of a retail comp competitive market. One of the prizes is that you actually get presented with a choice between fixed and variable tariffs over some period of time, and you can choose according to your preference. Uh, if you don't see those things emerging in a retail arrangement, you aren't really getting the full value of what a retail market is supposed to give. It's supposed to give options to transform risk between flat and variable as well as high to low. So that's something. Will we get that if we do retail competition in the Philippines? Well, that's one of the important questions. And it will reveal, if you do, whether people value insurance. Um, you just want to signal ahead where possible. It's not so friendly to find out a month or two later that your costs are going to be much higher than you thought. Given a given example, it's an Australian example, not exactly related to here, but it's got a parallel. Um, there's a, uh, an industrial cost customer in uh, in Queensland that bought some controlling technology so that it could manage their load. Uh, whenever they saw the wholesale price go up, they could stop producing and avoid that. Uh, but there's an idiosyncrasy in the Australian market in that prices for every five minutes are average six of them into a 30-minute price. 
And so what happens is if the last five minute segment of a 30 minute price is a high price, it means that all of the generate all of the usage that that customer had for the previous five periods gets charged the high price. In other words, something that happens tomorrow affects what happens the, the, the past. In other words, the, the end user was not able to figure out how to use their control technology to avoid a price spike because the price spike manipulated cause prices in other periods to, to 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 change so one of the lessons is that if you want market response to these things market response often helps mitigate some of this all of the pricing arrangements have to be have to be timely um, you have to signal ahead give people some opportunity to do something to avoid the cost um, the common issue is to intervene in the markets whenever the prices go up. And whenever you intervene, there's an unintended consequence. It's easy for me to get up here and say, don't do it. I really firmly believe it shouldn't be done. Uh, but the real question is, what, do you, what, do you, what are your alternatives? If you see that you need to be intervening frequently, there's something wrong. That needs to be addressed before you can really talk about protecting people from price spikes without doing some other damage. You can certainly encourage the removal of constraints or the introducing of better contracts. There is nothing more likely to be successful in protecting people against uncertainty in prices as a more rich and diverse contracting environment. That's been the holy grail, I think, of the Wesson. There's still some long ways to go. We're still doing too many, what you might call bilateral, almost PPA-like contracts. And we're not really seeing anything like the diversity of, of electricity contracts that are um, are the hallmark of, of, of real competitive markets elsewhere. Um, one option is, of course, to invest more in renewable energy, which is less exposed to hydrology or less exposed, or if it's not hydro, or less exposed to fuel prices. But that, too, comes at a cost. Um, it is not a free lunch, and it is not cheaper than the other stuff. Not yet. Not without a heroic range of, 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 of assumptions that don't hold water. So we're not quite there, but we might be willing to pay a premium if we don't like the volatility in fossil fuels, if we don't like um, the volatility in hydro uncertainty, maybe we would be willing to pay a premium for that. That's what the fit does. It adds a cost. Um, we can enhance competition. That's to get the demand response. Uh, that's slow to develop here. It's quite important. Uh, if somebody can actually reduce load in time ahead of a price spike, maybe the price spike won't be quite so big. Uh, and that means the monthly bills will be more manageable when they when customers see them. Because if I'm an, if I'm a customer who can manage my demand, and and you're a residential customer who benefits from a more moderated wholesale market, uh, my actions actually help you. There's a spillover. The other is month-to-month uh, -month balancing of uh, energy bills uh, is not strictly necessary, and it's not actually that common. Uh, you could go to three months, quarter, half year, four months, a year, all as a function of how much volatility, how much working capital is required to do this, what do you think is the underlying driver of the, um, of the cycle. If it's fuel prices, then you can watch fuel prices go up for four or five years in a row. You'll never catch up. If it's something more hydrological driven, then it will balance out over time. So you have to give some thought to, uh, to, to do that. But when you look at, for the last four or five years, how many of the overs and the unders have balanced out, um, you know, what we're doing is we're putting a lot of volatility into the market that doesn't necessarily need to be there. And so, um, whether or not you decide to go all the way to small customer choice is an interesting decision. A lot of other markets have managed to avoid that. Um, and to come up with smoothing or other kinds of contractually protecting mechanisms, certainly expanding the scope of retail competition dramatically over what exists now, but not necessarily taking it all the way down and leaving some kinds of protective contracts in place is probably not an unreasonable thing. Let people who can deal with price volatility deal with it, protect those who cannot. Last two points. Um, the ancillary services market has been a long time Incoming, still not here, been talked about forever. It was my first project in the Philippines, 1990, I don't know, whatever. 
2007, actually. Um, it's just another source of value for flexible demand and supply response. If you want more flexible demand and supply response, and by that I mean the flexibility to deal with an event that might cause a price disruption, then giving all of the sets of value to those investors that you can possibly do it so that they will find every possible way of bringing flexible response into the system is a way of reducing the cost of that, improving load factor and everything else. And finally, you could think, if you really wanted to get out of the box, you could, decompart, you could decom decompose some of the volatility into weather-related volatility and non-weather-related volatility, like the 2010 versus the other years. And you could use the, 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 the shifts in weather. Um, it's just not an easy thing, but I think it's worth thinking about to create a, a more of a smoothing effect for certain parts of the, uh, the, the price signals. It wouldn't be that hard to come up with the temperature normalized adjustment factor, for example. Um, anyway, those are some means and some mechanisms, maybe, maybe, um, um, maybe some tough ones, and I will, um, I will just let you guys uh, think about that and happy to take questions.